So what we're supposed to be doing as parents is we start with high control. Don't let your child go out into the street. You know, you grab them. And, but when they're 18, you're not chasing them out into the street anymore. You are working your way out of a job. And so as you continue on, it's less and less control. So that when 18 comes, there should be a little bit of an element of get out of here. Because, <laughs> you know, you start driving each other crazy, but also they've been trained up into that point and they have, hopefully you have let the world have consequences that have taught them and they have learned how to do their own laundry and all of that kind of stuff. I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Graced Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves and enjoy a little chocolate. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. I will periodically have conversations with people about my podcast because if you have spoken with me, for better or for worse, all conversations lead back to the podcast because I love it so much and because I have such amazing conversations with people. So when people say, well, what kind of episodes do you have? My general answer is we have graced filled conversations about physical, mental and spiritual health with a smattering of parenting and other episodes. As I'm getting to know my community through our free Graced Health Community Facebook group, which if you aren't on, I would love for you to join. The link is in the show notes um, through Instagram and most importantly, the survey that anyone can fill out at any time. And I will put that on in the episode description as well, also known as the show notes. I realize many of us are in an empty nesting stage, some at the very beginning of it, some are kind of closing the door and they're just, they're just done. And empty nesting isn't really even on the radar anymore because they have transitioned fully into whatever life is called after. (laughs) I don't even know. Um, Personally, my two sons, um, I have two boys. One of them is in college and one of them is a junior in high school. So I'm, I'm turning that corner. I have like one out and one left. Mary DeMuth is my guest today, and she has written a book that is beautiful and grace giving, but also a growth oriented resource for fostering your relationship with your adult child. And I would encourage any of you who have teen or high school age children, this is for you as well. She has such great wisdom. And so keep listening, keep listening. I promise this is worth your time. I invited her on to discuss her book, Love, Pray, Listen, Parenting Your Wayward Adult Kids with Joy. So regardless if your children are wayward or not, This book is full of applicable wisdom, uh, biblical based wisdom in expressing love to and fostering good relationships with your adult child. Mary DeMuth is an international speaker, podcaster, and the author of, okay, get this, 40, 40, y'all, that's a big deal, (laughs) books, um, both fiction and nonfiction. Through God's healing, Mary has overcome a difficult past to become an authentic example of what it means to live a brand new story. She loves to help others restory their lives through the book she writes. She lives in Texas with her husband of 30 years and is mom to three adult children. I know you're going to love this episode with Mary DeMuth. Welcome, Mary. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. And I love the subject of your podcast. I'm always thinking of ways to be healthy and um, stay uh, moving and um, eating well. So it kind of fits right in. Yes. Well, and of course, we do that all of that through a grace-filled lens because God does not call us to be perfect in anything, even um, even in just how we take care of our bodies. So um it, it, thank you very much for that. Okay, so we were talking a little bit before we hit record, Mary, and I just think that this is such a fantastic book. 
and I think it is so appropriate for basically any parent who has adult children. I don't think I realized how challenging it was going to be. I mean, Littles was its own kind of challenge, right? Like you've got, you know, I walked around with a a baby on the hip and a baby on the breast for a really long time, (laughs) you know, um, it it's, and I only have two children. Once your kids get to be older, there's this element of like, these are humans. These are not people you can control. These are like living, breathing children of God who have their own unique thoughts and actions and um, perceptions about things. And parenting them becomes a lot more complicated. I mean, that, that at least has been my experience. In preparation for our time together, I pulled uh, my community like, hey, what kind of questions do you have about parenting your own children? having said all of that, like there's an element as a mom of protection, like I don't want to cross any boundaries with my own children. So these questions today are kind of a combination of that. And then also just of things that I noticed when I was, um, when I was reading your book. So what I want to start with is why this book, what is, (laughs) you know, I have found that often our passion comes from our pain. And I was wondering if you could share your story since you like to talk about stories and and uh, what the impetus of this book was, uh, what drove you to write it, and um, all of that stuff. Yeah, so um, I do have three adult children, and they're in their 20s and 30s. And several years ago, before I had adult children, I was in a kind of a prayer loop where there was a mom on there whose joy rose and fell on the decisions that her adult children would make. And I kind of made a little, you know, note in my head, like, I don't want that to be me. And it was easy to say that and make a little vow about it. But once my kids hit those, you know, adult ages, it was like, okay, (laughs) this is hard. And it's not simply a decision of I'm not going to let them their decisions affect my joy. It was more of a a deeper work that I had to do and a deeper walk through the scriptures. Um, And so that's really why I wrote the book. It was my own journey of coming to grips with, you know, and, and again, this isn't necessarily a book for wayward children. It's just a book for parents of adult children. And what is it like to let go? And how can you find joy, even if your expectations are not as being met, or if their decisions are breaking your heart, or whatever, you can still find joy? Yes, you. uh, Yes, all of that. (laughs) It can be, um, I, I, my pastor says every now and then, and he likes to remind us that your children's decisions, it's not a parenting report card. Your children is not a parenting <laughs> report card. It's an important part to remember, point to remember, and obviously you don't use those exact words in your book, but it's the same point you are making. And I think too, sometimes we have this expectation as Jesus followers and as we live our lives in the church that, well, if I raise my child in the church, and if they attended youth group and I made sure that they went on their trips or their mission trips or, you know, what, however you define that, that they're going to turn out a certain way and that they will continue that walk. I would love to hear your wisdom or your encouragement to release that comparison that we can very easily create or have placed upon us in, um, in our circles of faith. Yeah, I think it's inevitable that we will. Um, it, because we're in this environment of church and we can't help but look around. And the the odd thing that I've learned is, you know, I was raised in a terrible environment and I met Jesus and my life turned out well. Um, and then there are people that are raised in amazing environments with Christians and with prayer and the church and they run amok. So there's not I think we believe that there's a formula, even though intellectually we may not say it, but we believe there is. We kind of believe that if we do all the right things, then at the end of the parenting machine, out will pop these perfectly obedient adult children who love Jesus. And so then when, if, and when (laughs) that doesn't happen immediately, because we're also American and we want it right now, um, then we can tend to compare ourselves to others. 
And it's just fruitless because you're truly comparing apples and oranges. You don't know what's really going on. And this is the journey God has you on, and he will give you the strength that you need to bear up under it, no matter what is involved in that journey. That is a great point. And I mean, it really is, you know, when you think about, like, I talk a lot about our, our bodies were made so uniquely, right? And that God, we are all made in the image of God and our uniqueness is part of that. And, you know, I feel like too, one of the things that you're saying is our family dynamics are going to be unique. Our children's paths are going to be unique. And so even though we're, we may all be in a church, uh, I love that you say there's no formula because mm-hmm it's just, it will look different because everything, because of the dynamics and because we were, our kids were, are obviously all, all unique in how they receive and respond to things. You talk a lot about embracing our own uh, brokenness as it relates to our adult children um, and that we are all fellow strugglers. So what are some of the ways that we can we can do this in in an effort to um, keep a strong relationship or maybe repair a relationship with our children. First thing that's really helpful for me is to remember myself in my twenties, and to know that I don't agree with that Mary back then <laughs> because I was evolving, I was growing, I was changing, and I did love Jesus during my twenties, but there's still things about that, me that were really immature, and so if we can grant grace to the younger us, then that will help us to grant grace to our kids who are just trying to figure things out. Plus the idea that um, they are navigating things we never had to. And so more grace needs to abound because we didn't have to walk through the mire of social media and constant comparison. We didn't um, have the kind of 24 seven media that's going on right now. And just the pain of all of that. Um, we, we weren't in the middle of a depression slash suicide epidemic, especially for young girls, a mental health crisis. And so we just need to understand that, uh, we're all broken people. We manifest that brokenness in different ways, but if we can view our kids as fellow strugglers along the journey, we're going to have a lot more grace than trying to form them into our image and make them be as mature as we are right now when we weren't even as mature as we are in our 20s. That's an excellent point. And I like the reminder that they are dealing with things that we never had to contend with. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you the conversations I've had with friends and other people who have said something to the effect of, oh my goodness, I'm so glad portable cameras and social media was not around (laughs) documenting all of the nonsense (laughs) Mm -hmm. and uh, tomfoolery that I, you know, of my twenties. And so you're right. And that is, I mean, it's, it's a hard perception to live up to. And then of course, when you layer on all of the uh, Instagrammable poses and pictures, Mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot, that's a lot for them to deal with for sure. Okay. So I, I'm one of these people who, number one, takes a lot of notes. So you'll probably see me doing that. But also when I read nonfiction, it's something that strikes me, I will underline it. And then when I f- see something else, like I will make a little arrow. And I mean, t- I'm, this is so underlined. Like I have, there are so <laughs> many nuggets of wisdom within this book, just again, just in parenting in general. So I just pulled out one of them. And I, I, it's not necessarily my favorite, but I just thought it was one that we could talk about. So if you don't mind me quoting you for just a second, (laughs) sure. It's called, um, or it says it's very hard to grow in a vacuum. We've seen that through the pandemic and all its isolation, we grow best with others. So if we don't rub shoulders with people, how can their iron sharpen I our iron? And I really love that image and that reminder of just rubbing shoulders, not only with our adult children, but also with other people. And so you frame this around, you know, our relationship with our adult children. But one of the things that I read that through the lens of was um, having other like-minded believers. So like I have was in Bible studies for years and years and years and, you know, truly believe in the power of that. It is a fine line, though, of asking for prayers and guidance and wisdom with others 
and then crossing a boundary of pri- privacy. And I don't know what that is. I struggle with that. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've struggled with that. So I was wondering if you have any recommendations on navigating that tension. Yeah, I would say it depends on the size of your circle. And so I wouldn't um, necessarily share it in a wide circle, but I would definitely share your prayer request with a trusted friend in a small circle. Someone who you know to be trustworthy, who's not going to blare it out to the populace, someone who's mature enough to handle it and receive it. On the other hand, I would say my husband and I, through some of our struggles with our adult kids, lead a life group at our church, and we made the decision to be honest about it. And it has opened up a door for all the other people struggling to share what they're going through in a very safe place. And we've established it as a safe, quiet place, um, but so that no one feels alone anymore. And I think that's a lot of the problem with parents of adult kids is we just don't talk about these things. We are so afraid of protecting privacy that we we never unburden ourselves. I When the book released, I got a text from a friend of mine who I know pretty well. And she said, you have no idea how much I need this book. And I literally had no idea. I had no idea that she was going through this struggle with um, one of her kids. And I think, um, of course, be cautious about it and be with safe people, but you cannot carry this alone and you're not meant to carry it alone. Uh, You are so right. It can be lonely. Absolutely. Because of that. And so that's really good encouragement. And I just kind of think back to my own um, walks with my friends quite literally. So I, my, my thing is I go for a walk with a friend and then that's where we really mm-hmm. flesh it out. I think it's such a safe space to do that. But I like how y- you, you tell us to, yeah, I mean, to, to and bring people in, invite people in so they don't feel lonely, but make sure that that circle is really small. Cause I think that that is important. Um, Facebook, for me is not that place. <laughs> no, no, no. This is one on, this is people in person kind of thing. So not, uh, not on Facebook. Yeah, I actually, um, I made it, and this was just my own personal parenting decision, but you know, my kids are 17 and 19. And so I think the iPhone came out in 2008, which means that my youngest was three at the time. And so they've kind of grown up with, with digital phones. And I think Facebook was started in 2008 too, if I remember correctly. Mm. And I just made a decision a long time ago. I thought I am going to let them develop their own social identity Mm -hmm. and I will put things out there with their permission. But Mm -hmm. I just thought, I don't know what they're going to want out there. And I'm glad I did. I have one who will like, he's fine with whatever, but another, another one of mine is insanely private, just like his dad. So Mm -hmm you you've got to definitely have to um be careful with all of that i heard a um sermon several oh gosh i think it was about a year ago uh, done by andy stanley and he talked about the nuns have you heard this sermon at all or heard this um well i've definitely heard the phraseology <laughs> okay <laughs> Um, So the nuns are not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E for people who maybe haven't heard this term. And it's basically that it is, um, they are young adults, um, I I don't know if primarily is the right way, but people who just are, just don't identify with any kind of faith. They're not atheists. They're not agnostic. They're just, they're not Christian. They're just, they're just not, they're just, it just doesn't exist for them. This is a big um, exodus, you know, for lack of a better word from faith and from, um, from Jesus. So when this happens for parents who have, um, raised their children in a church, try to instill the love of Jesus within our children, it's, it can be heartbreaking for sure. What would you say to the parents who are experiencing that and who are maybe worried about how this nunness is um, impacting their children's future in heaven? Well, first I'll say that's very normal to be worried and concerned and to be grieving. And um, the best thing to do right now is if you're walking through that is to grieve it. And to, I walk people through in the book, uh, an exercise of writing your own lament psalm. 
Um, because I think a lot of us just stuff it and don't talk about it and don't grieve it. But I think the first step is to be honest about it and to grieve. Um, the other thing I would say is we have a very limited perspective on God's uh, capabilities. Uh, for instance, I just had a 40-year-old prayer, a prayer I had been praying for 40 years answered this last year. Was I discouraged during those 40 years? Did I want to give up praying for that thing? Yes. But God perfectly answered that prayer in his own timing. And I think part of the problem that we have is that we, when we say a prayer, we expect that initially and immediately it will be answered. And when it's not, we start doubting the Lord instead of choosing maturity and realize that God takes a long time. There's a, a quote that I have right in front of me by a lady named Miss Joan, which is a friend of my friends at a, at a church that she met. And she said, sometimes God takes a long time to do something suddenly. And I think that's an important quote to remember. He, his timing is not what we expect. And so we have to maintain the relationship, if we can, with our adult kids trusting that God loves them far more than we do and that he has a beautiful plan for them. And to also remember the story of the prodigal son. So in the prodigal son, the father did not chase the prodigal son. And it's interesting when, um, when this story is shared with people in Africa, so um, people on you know sub-Saharan Africa typically, when an American or when a Western person hears the prodigal son story and we're asked to summarize it, we'll say, oh, that's the story where the guy ran away and did naughty things. But if you share that same story in an African context, they'll say that's the story of the famine. And because we haven't experienced famine, we don't see the story through that lens. But it is the famine that brings the prodigal son back. And so not that we're going to pray send disaster on my kids, but just that we would pray that the lure of this world would become like a famine to our kids. It would no longer satisfy them as it had uh, at first. So that that's kind of how I view it. I kind of need to take a time out and digest that. That's fantastic. <laughs> I won't make you sit on the time out though. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, no, that, that's, that is, that's really good. I, I had never considered it that way. It's funny, we had a, a guest on, uh, CJ Randolph, who quite literally has a, a prodigal son uh, moment with his dad. And I think about if I put that lens through his story, that's exactly what he was experiencing. And uh, yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Let's talk some about control. Mm, yes. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and how we have none <laughs> with our children, mm -hmm. but it is, it's a hard, it's a transition, right? So when we have younger children, there is an element of control that we need to have to keep them safe, to keep their physical needs met that, you know, to make sure that they are going to bed at a decent time. So they get sleep. I mean, there's, there's some of that. And of course, there are definitely things that I wish I would have done differently, even with my children as very, I mean, babies and, and toddlers. However, you know, there is a little bit of an element with that. Um, and so I guess, first of all, I'm going to have you dig into, if you don't mind, um, releasing the, that transition of releasing control of our adult children and what that should look like in this phase. And so what I have seen um, and counseled with uh, parents that is difficult is if they have a high level of control throughout all of their parenting journey. And then suddenly their child turns 18 and they have this incredible void and they lose purpose and they are so sad because they no longer have, you know, what they thought that, you know, they've been working all that time and they, they basically lost everything when the child walked out the door. So what we're supposed to be doing as parents is we start with high control. Don't let your child go out into the street. <laughs> you know, you grab them. and But when they're 18, you're not chasing them out into the street anymore. You are working your way out of a job. And so as you continue on, it's less and less control so that when 18 comes, there should be a little bit of an element of get out of here because, <laughs> you know, you start driving each other crazy, but also they've been trained up into that point and they have, hopefully you have let 
the world have consequences that have taught them and they have learned how to do their own laundry and all of that kind of stuff. So when you have high control and you're taking care of your child until 18, it's going to be very difficult. So to all those parents who have kids less than 18, start now in letting go of control. Let them learn things on their own. Let them fall. Let them make mistakes. What I'm finding with the next generation is they have no suffering muscle at all because we as parents have rescued them from absolutely everything. And so when they do get out into the world and something bad happens, which it will and will continue to do so, they have no resilience. They have no grit because they've been protected from pain all those years. So you're not doing them any favors and you're actually, in a way, contributing to their mental health crisis later by always rescuing them. Yes. And boy, it is easy to listen to those words and nod and so hard (laughs) to actually step into that. (laughs) It's so true though. I mean, there were there, um, I have heard parents and friends share like, Oh, I've got to let, I've got to let them work through this. And of course we've had our own, own moments of that, but it is true. And I, and I think it's, you're not doing your kid any favors either. Like if they don't know how to, function outside of tight grip, then what are they going to do when they don't have a grip on them when they're in whatever takes them after college? I mean, after high school, whether it's college or, you know, anything else. So yeah, it it is good. And there was a study that was done that I um, noted in a book that I wrote uh, called Authentic Parenting in a Postmodern Culture. And in the study, I can't remember the exact percentages, but it was a fairly high percentage that kids who are raised in high, high control were more likely to follow a cult leader in college than any other group. It's, and it makes sense if you think about it, because the child needs this hierarchical person to dictate everything about their lives. And when they go off to college, they no longer have that. And so if they don't know how to navigate life, they're going to find someone who's probably abusive, who, uh, you know, a cult leader would definitely fit in that category. And so it, it, that's why it's so important that we begin to let go slowly throughout their lives. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. Here's another tricky thing. So we are learning to release control on our kids, let them fail, let them struggle. I like how you call it a suffering muscle. But the problem is we're not doing this in a vacuum and we have people watching us. And sometimes it is our own leaders within our life watching. So maybe it is um, leaders within a church, maybe it is extended family, or maybe our own parents who are watching going, well, that's not how I would do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think that way is right. I think you should do this. I'm wondering if you... Uh, Mary, if you have any suggestions on navigating specifically familial relationships outside of us and our spouse and our children, as we are watching them suffer all of that, and then also as we are building or mending our relationships. I mean, you know, like we said at the beginning, this, this is a book for parents of wayward children, though I think it's applicable to anyone. But that's a hard thing too, because I'm sure there's a lot of, well, why don't you? Well, this is what I would do. And so give us a little guidance on how to, I don't know, how to navigate that. Well, I would say that first of all, um, that's, it's not easy. And, and it's okay to accept advice and say, Hey, thanks so much for sharing that with me. I'll take it to the Lord. But the most important thing is take this to the Lord and and understand the power of the Holy Spirit within you and within your spouse and let him guide you. And so if he's guided you a way that makes your mother-in-law angry, okay, so what? Because you're, you're called not to uh, obey your mother-in-law. You are called to obey the Lord and the Lord knows your kids better than you do. And he knows best how to lead you. And sometimes that can be really lonely and you have to understand that you might be misunderstood, but the highest authority is the Lord. And also you've mentioned that all families are different. So in some cases you might have an adult kid who's living at home and making terrible decisions and economically wasting you. And it is exactly the right decision to kick them out. 
On the other hand, there could be someone in your home who is mentally unstable and desperately needs to be taken care of for a little bit longer and tough love is not going to work for them. So I would never say one over, over the other because each incident is unique and that's why each of us has a unique relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's a great point. One of the things I do that drives my children crazy is I always relate, I don't always, but I often will relate a completely different lesson to that of health. And what you're saying reminds me of, you know, something that I will tell people, which is if someone's saying you that this is the only one and only way to take care of yourself or to eat or to exercise, then you, you need to run the other way because mm-hmm. God did not create a perfect eating plan or movement or anything like that. Um, otherwise it would be in the good book itself. And so obviously a side of eating his foods, um, you know, that he gave us, yes. <laughs> but, but you know, those extremes living within those extremes and saying, well, this is how it absolutely needs to be m- more than likely is not necessarily the right way for, for you or for your children. Yeah. Okay, I'm wondering if you have any, um, because this book is focused on um, parenting your wayward adult kids with joy, I'm wondering if you have just any general encouragement for parents who are As I'd mentioned earlier, I just think it's so important to let someone else know what you're going through, to grieve it personally and as a couple. But then I think there needs to be a holy stomp on the ground. (laughs) And what I mean by that is the enemy is attacking our kids. And if he gets a victory there, we can always get on our knees and we can pray. But if it causes us to change our theology, if it causes us to turn away from the Lord, if it takes away all of our joy that we stop doing the ministry that he's called us, that God has called us to, then the enemy gets a second victory. And so my encouragement, it's a little bit of a a difficult word, but my encouragement, my encouragement is don't let the enemy get a second victory. Do your work with the Lord and understand that this is probably one of the most fruitful times in your life, in this stage of life. And uh, if we are constantly letting the choices of another, whether it be an adult child or maybe our adult parents who are driving us crazy, if we're constantly on that leash, we are going to be undermined for the kingdom. So we need to do that hard work so that we can continue to do the work of the kingdom. The lament prayer that you mentioned just a second ago really comes to mind. I like how in the book you kind of walk us through that and then you take us um, kind of from the beginning with, um, I think it was David. Sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. And parallel that to our um, our own situation. And I think that that is a really great place to start. And, you know, you were talking some about our Americanized version of things. And lamenting is a not one that we talk a lot about here in the church, but it's, it's pretty powerful. It is. And it's necessary. And if you look at the Psalms, there's a great majority of the Psalms that are lament Psalms and they follow that very specific pattern. It begins with telling God you're really, really mad and then kind of working your way through to the very end where you declare, but yet I know you're good. I know you're going to take care of me. I know your plans are perfect, but you don't get to that second half until you start with, I'm really, really mad. If someone were to go through that, do you recommend um, writing that down or just kind of in their head? I mean, is there a certain, again, not a formula because we're not talking about formulas mm-hmm. today, but a like if you were to guide someone through that, how would you do that? I would have them physically write it down. And when I bring people through this workshop, um, and I've done it quite a bit, it's been really incredible. I've seen God set people free just to have the words on the paper and the tactile feeling of actually writing it rather than typing it is really important. Okay. You mentioned workshops. So you come to, you will go to churches. Um, Tell us a little bit about what you do with those workshops. Um, I'm assuming that you will go into places or are these, if I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but will you tell us some about that? Yeah, so I'm happy to come in uh, into a church and do a parenting seminar on 
this particular topic. I also have written other parenting books. So if there's a need for a wide variety of parenting topics, I can do that. Um, so yeah, I have all that content and happy to bring it to people. I think there's a lot of hurting people out there. In fact, when I was talking to my pastor and I go to a large, large church, he said the number one thing that he hears when he's uh, people are walking by him in the hallway after the service is, I'm so sad about my adult child. And so I think it would be great to have even a Sunday morning message just letting people know they are not alone. Because I think there's this whole generation of parents that are suffering in silence and feel like I'm the only one. Yes, you are right. Um, and they are not alone. And we definitely need to create spaces, just like we have created spaces for um, moms of young children. So they know mm -hmm. that they're not the only ones who are up at 3 a.m. and they're exhausted mm -hmm. all day. We need to create spaces for safe spaces for parenting, uh, for parents of, of older children, because we never stop parenting. It's, <laughs> it's just, um, it's different. You know, I've witnessed that from other people. And ex I mean, how many times my husband and I have called our parents, like, how do we do this? Or what do we do about this? So it's, it's never end until it's never done until God calls us home for sure. Well, before um, I get into the final questions that I have for my guest, Mary, I just want to thank you for this book. Uh, a, the couple words that I wrote about it or wrote down about it was just a grace and growth mindset. Mm. So it's giving mm. ourselves grace for all the things that we aren't necessarily going to do, but also continuing to grow and to grow in um, growing the Lord, grow in our relationship with our kids. And um, just a, it's just a kind of a constant refinement rather than searching for a final endpoint, like, okay, well, I'm done, you know, check the box, we're good. <laughs> so thank you for this book. It, it truly was fantastic. And I, uh, if you're listening, I highly, highly recommend it if you have, um, if you have adult children. And Mary, you've been saying 18, is that kind of the, the tipping point of where you would recommend people read this? I actually think parents of teens would get a lot out of this too, because it's a good preparation for what's coming next. And the more we can learn how to have those kind of life changing conversations with our kids before they leave the nest, the more likely they're going to have those life changing conversations with us after they leave the nest. Great point. That's a really great point. Okay. I've got a couple questions I ask all my guests. Number one is I love learning about people's tattoos. Uh, I don't have any, but I have found that, uh, and I just don't have any because I haven't really I don't know what I want to put on. I, I, you know, I just don't know. But I have found that people um, will often have a meaning behind it if they choose to put something on their body for the rest of their life. <laughs> so I was wondering if you had any tattoos. And actually, I know the answer to this because you were messing around with your camera. So I got to see it or I got to see that you did have one. Um, if you would mind sharing, uh, sharing what it means and, and where it is. So it's on, whoop, there it is, on my wrist and it says Jesus. And uh, it just reminds me of the the nail scarred hands of my Savior. Um, I'm inscribed on the palm of His hands, um, and it's a place that I see all the time. And so it's just a reminder of that's the most important person in my life, and of course God in my life. Um, and I also felt like you know I got this kind of before it was okay <laughs> to get one. And, you know, um, and I knew that I would get in trouble when I was speaking in front of audiences. So I thought if it says Jesus, I'm not going to get in trouble because <laughs> I'm like, well, it says Jesus. It's not like it's something else. So, um, but yeah, he's the most important thing to me. And that's why I got that. That's great. You're right. The mentality surrounding tattoos has definitely changed a lot. I think I read something one time that like 70% of U.S. adults have tattoos. Real quickly, can you tell people how they can connect with you and also tell them about the Pray Every Day podcast? Because if they're not listening, they may want to because we're always listening. We're always searching for a quality, good truth in our ears. So yes, you can um, look it up on wherever you listen to your podcast, Pray Every Day and My Name, Mary DeMuth. Um, it just passed 4 million downloads. It's a simple format. It's only five minutes a day. I read about a chapter of the Bible and I'm, I'm reading them in order. So next is going to be the book of Jeremiah. Just finish the book of John. So um, I read a, about a chapter and then I pray according to that chapter for you. And um, it's been, it's about four years old now, or just starting its fifth 
25th year. And it's just been really fun to see God do amazing things. People all over the world listen to it and all these testimonies of cool things happening. So very simple, five minutes a day. And also um, people can find me at Mary Demuth on Instagram and Twitter. Um, my website's marydemuth.com. And I do have a freebie for your listeners. They can go to marydemuth.com slash LPL, which would stand for love, pray, listen, marydemuth.com slash LPL. And it's 52 prayers for your adult kids um, as a PDF. And uh, every week you can pray a prayer for them in case you are just like so overwhelmed, you don't have a prayer to pray. And there's blanks in it. So you can put their actual name in it. So that's my gift to your listeners. You have a real gift at that. I'm on your email list. And we also receive every Thursday, your Thursday Mm -hmm. appoint, I probably said that wrong. But uh, where you will have, you know, just kind of some updates or, you know, newsletter type stuff, but then also an individualized prayer. So I encourage people to get on that list as well. Tell them really quickly how they can do that. Cause it's been so long. I don't remember how. Yeah. So if you just go to marydemuth.com, a little pop-up will pop up and you can find it that way. Okay. That sounds good. And I apologize, Mary. I said your last name wrong at the very beginning. Demuth, not Demuth. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> no worries. It's, I have to always remind people it's like a little kitty cat meowing. It's Demuth. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's cute. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I normally get left. People have this and I did not include this in your pick and your, in my prep for you. Do you have a meaningful Bible verse that you would like to share with my community? Uh, I really love second Corinthians 12, nine and 10, which um, Paul is asking about the thorn and he wants it to be taken away. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And then Paul goes on to say that he most gladly therefore would boast about his weaknesses. The power of Christ would be made strong in him. And then he says all these things that he's content with weaknesses, insults, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And I think that is a perfect verse for parents of kids and parents of adult kids because we understand our weakness. And our weakness is the place where the Lord has his best opportunity to work. When we're strong and we think we have it all together, he has no way to get a word in edgewise. But when we are weak, it is his dance floor to dance his best steps uh, in our lives. That's beautiful and so true. Yes. Okay. I'm going to let you have the last word. What is the one simple thing you would like to um, someone listening to remember about today's conversation? I guess it would just be the the title of the book, Love, Pray, Listen. Um, if we can err on the side of loving our kids and we can pray for them, these are the things that we can do. Like we talk about, we don't have control. Well, you can love them. You can pray for them. And if you're still in a relationship with them, you can absolutely listen to them and have a holy curiosity about who they are and how God is making them. And so I guess I would just leave them with those three words. No, it's great. It's great. Okay. That is all for today. Go out there and have a great day. 